Steve, thank you so much for, for agreeing to speak to us tonight. We used to have Dr. Roland quite often as a speaker when I first came to Friends of Gold Butte, and he's excellent, and he's a really smart guy and knows hey, a lot thanks, about Brenda. a lot of stuff. Hope I can live up to that intro. He, you definitely can. So with that, I'm going to let you take it. And then what we will do, guys, for those of you that haven't been on before, is we'll ask you to um, stop your video and mute yourselves during his presentation. And I'll do the same. And then when he's finished, you can restart uh, your video and or use your microphone and ask any questions. Are you all right with that, Steve? Sure, that's fine. Oh, okay. Sounds good. So I, I, I want to talk about Nevada's vertebrate fossil record and 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 part of that story, not the main part, but but a little bit of that story is why dinosaurs are not a conspicuous part of the Nevada fossil record. We have lots of cool fossils in Nevada. As as you know, I was professor at UNLV for a long time, 41 years, and never ran out of interesting fossils to study, especially Nevada fossils. Um, but we're not a dinosaur state in the sense that we get lots and lots of dinosaurs. Um, so I I work part time now. I retired from UNLV in 2019. I still have an office on campus. And I'm still there sometimes, interacting with the faculty and working on research projects. But but uh, my main home these days professionally is the Las Vegas Natural History Museum. And if you haven't been there, you might want to come by, especially if you have children or grandchildren. If, if you visit the museum, which is on Las Vegas Boulevard North, 900, right next to the old Mormon fort, um, so pretty easy to find. And if you just go into the museum and wander around, you'd think that dinosaurs are, are the main paleontology story because we have lots of dinosaurs on display and animatronic ones that roar and all that. And, and that kids love that stuff. And so that's fine. Um, but here in the lab where I work, these are a couple of my volunteers. We work on fossils uh, that came most, well, almost exclusively from Nevada and mostly from Southern Nevada. Um, he, here's one of my volunteers, for example, working on a, a tusk of a Colombian mammoth that was completely covered with, with uh, this, this uh, coating of, ah, my brain just fried, um, this, this coating that we put on fossils when we when we uh, collect them in the field. So typically when we collect fossils in the field, we don't take the time, maybe it's 110 degrees out or cold and windy. So we, we protect them as best we can in the field with this, with this coating. Um, and then we'll come back the next day um, and, and usually uh, cover, uh, un dig underneath it and turn it over and, and, uh, and then bring it into the lab. So this one, for example, my volunteer here is working on this other uh, plaster jacket. So it's plaster of Paris. That's the word I couldn't think of. So plaster of Paris. Um, and, and so this fossil, this, this pl plaster jacket or field jacket is actually upside down relative to how we collected it first in the field. And so the fossils are upside down relative to how they've been lying in the, in the desert sediments for the last 20 or so thousand years. Um, and, and it's of course caked with, with sand and silt and so my volunteers and I um, take use dental picks and little brushes and so on and remove carefully remove that sand and silt uh, and until we get down to the bone or the tusk and then we brush that clean and put some consolidant on it um, a, a, a chemical called paraloid which is a, a standard vertebrate paleo technique uh, and then eventually we have nicely exposed bones in and usually we leave them in the jacket. And then they go, could go on display or they go in our repository across the street uh, for future research. Most of the fossils that we're working on right now come from Tule Springs Fossil Bed National Monument. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. It's <coughs> northern part of the Las Vegas Valley, parallel to Highway 95. Um, I, I'm on the board of protectors of Tule Springs, and we're celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the creation of this national monument. Uh, in December of this year. So it's just been 10 years since this monument was created. But of course, those fossils have been there for, for tens of thousands of years, and paleontologists have known about them in almost 100 years. So since the 1930s, uh, paleontologists have been collecting fossils in what is now Tule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument, 
And most of those fossils ultimately end up at the museum where I work, the Las Vegas Natural History Museum. We're the official repository for fossils collected on federal land in Southern Nevada. So we have a lot of them. Uh, most, most of them are across the street in our repository. Here's, here's part of what is now Ice Age Fossil State Park, this trench, which is of course partly collapsed now, and, and I'm sure some of you know the story, this trench was excavated in 1962 and 63 during this event, um, sometimes referred to as the Big Dig. I'm not going to talk in detail about that um, tonight, that's, that's for another night, um, but um, the, that Big Dig and, and all those trenches exposed the stratigraphy, which is really important for geologists to understand the layers. Each layer has its own history, its own age, its own fossil collection, fossil representative fossils in it. Um, but all the fossils that we collect out there um, are Pleistocene fossils. We collect little tiny fossil snails, but most of the, all the vertebrates we collect are, are Ice Age mammals mammoths and camels and bison and horses and giant ground sloths and so on. The, the truth of it is it's mostly mammoths. That's what we get mostly, um, like, like these two here shown in this, this little diorama. And these are, these are Colombian mammoths, they're not woolly mammoths. Woolly mammoths did not live in Southern Nevada. They lived in, in, uh, farther north in Canada and Alaska, and then across the Bering Straits into Europe and Asia. So you read about uh, frozen mammoths being found in Siberia sometimes. Those are those are woolly mammoths, and they're, people are trying to get DNA out of that those frozen mammoths and recreate, uh, you know, bring bring back the woolly mammoths and, and so on. And that and that that actually might happen. I, I if I had to bet, I bet that in my lifetime uh, I'll I'll see that happen. Um, so those are those are woolly mammoths. But the ones that lived here are Colombian mammoths, which are the biggest mammoths that ever lived, about 14 feet at the shoulder. Um, restricted to North America, became extinct at the end of the Ice Age. Uh, in addition to the mammoths, of course, we have these um, bison antiquus, the Pleistocene bison, which is quite a bit bigger than its descendant bison, the, the ones that, that we know from Yellowstone and elsewhere on the plains, and, and various other uh, carnivores. We rarely, in Tule Springs, we rarely get carnivores. There's an odd toe bone of a dire wolf that we found a few years ago, and, and uh, some other workers found a, a, a kneecap of a, of a uh, saber-toothed cat, but we just r almost never get a whole specimen of anything. At the end of my talk tonight, I'm going to actually give you a, a little case study of a case where the only one in my career, in terms of vertebrate fossils, where we got the whole thing. It's extraordinarily rare, and certainly in Tule Springs, uh, it just doesn't happen. The animals died out in the wash, flood came along, um, the, the carnivores chewed on the bones and dragged them off to their den for their pups to chew on and so on. Flood came along and dispersed the bones and, and uh, they were trampled by other animals. So we, we just virtually never get a whole animal. We get we, the skulls and the tusks we get um, because they're more robust and hold up pretty well. But uh, we, we never get, almost never get all the, all the bones connected. Uh, one of the kinds of animals that's quite abundant, actually, um, not nearly as so much as, as mammoths, is camels. And people are a little surprised sometimes to know, to hear that we get camels in, in uh, the Tule Springs fossils and, and elsewhere in Nevada in the Ice Age. Um, so I, I want to just take a, take a minute to talk about the history of camels. It's a really interesting story. Camels evolved in North America. They're, that's their original home. And then sometime in the early Pleistocene, probably, when sea level was low, some of our North American camels sneaked across the Bering Land Bridge and uh, just when, when you could walk from Alaska to Siberia. So some of our camels did that. They walked from Alaska to Siberia and all the way down into Asia and Africa. And the African and Asian camels that we know today, Bactrian and Dromedary camels, are descended from North American camels that walked, walked there from, uh, from North America. Uh, so the camels, the, the, the natural home, the original home of camels is in North America. Not only that, but some of our camels went the other direction, went across the, the Panamanian land bridge into South America. And those are llamas and alpacas and vicuñas. The, the, the South American sort of camel looking animals are in fact camels that descended from North American camels. So camels originally uh, evolved in North America. If it wasn't for paleontology, we would never know that. Uh, and then they became extinct at the end of the Ice Age. That extinction 
we don't completely understand, but spear throwing men were almost certainly part of it. Uh, so overhunting by, I, I personally think, and most of my colleagues would agree with this, that uh, the climate was changing, the, the, the climate was getting warmer and drier, and these animals, which had adapted to a, a cooler, wetter climate, uh, were having a tough time. And then you have spear throwing men up here on the scene, uh, which pushed them over the brink. Okay, so that all that stuff is Pleistocene near the near the top of the of the column here, um, and so most of the fossils that we most of the vertebrate fossils that we hear about and collect and write papers on in in Nevada are in fact Pleistocene mammals. This, as many of you know, this the 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 dinosaurs, which I want to talk a little bit about, um, are mostly Jurassic and Cretaceous, a little bit in the Triassic. So they're in this Mesozoic era zone um, and we just don't get very many of them and, and and let me talk a little bit about why that is so here's a kind of fanciful picture of different kinds of dinosaurs um, which which came from the jurassic and cretaceous so why why don't we get dinosaurs more abundantly in nevada um, my, my friend nick saints who's on the on the zoom call tonight um, gave me a little trouble with with putting this in the title of my talk and i'll and i'll show you why because he he happens to be a real dinosaur fan and has written about dinosaurs in Nevada. And he want, he was a little offended, I think, that I was trying to minimize the importance of dinosaurs in Nevada. And so what I mean is, compared to many other states, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Alberta, Canada, we just don't have, dinosaurs are just not abundant and an important part of the fauna. One reason is habitat. So um, this is a snapshot of what North America looked like in the Cretaceous period, say 100 million years ago. At that time, there was a seaway the Cretaceous Interior Seaway that went all the way from the Arctic Ocean down to the Gulf of Mexico, separating North America into two big islands. And the really good habitat for dinosaurs, there were dinosaurs scattered around here over on this Appalachia Island, but, but this island here, this long skinny island on the, on the left, um, which is called Laramidia, by the way, we, we have a name for this Paleo Island, which comes from Laramie, Wyoming, for some reason. I, it was probably named by somebody from Laramie, I guess. I don't know the history of that naming, but this is Laramidia. Uh, and the really famous dinosaur localities are, are in this gray zone, which was an alluvial plain in, in the Cretaceous. Here's a close up of that. And so you can see these very schematically, these, these river systems draining out of this mountainous area into the alluvial plain. And this was really good habitat for dinosaurs. Dinosaurs mostly lived in low elevation, relatively flat terrain, um, tropical environments, or at least wet environments, moderately moist environments. Um, so notice where Nevada is here. Nevada is not in this gray band. Nevada is up in the mountains. So you drive from Mesquite, Nevada, right on the Utah border almost, uh, and there's no dinosaurs anywhere around Mesquite. You arrive in St. George a few miles away and suddenly you're in dinosaur country. It's as if when they drew the boundary between Nevada and, and Utah, they said all the, all the dinosaurs are going to be in Utah and Nevada's not going to get any. Well, that's not exactly what happened. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But it's almost what happened. Um, lots of dinosaurs in Utah. It's a very rich dinosaur state. The, the Utah State Museum, I guess it's called, or... Um, University of Utah Museum up on the hill in Salt Lake City, spectacular museum, just for for the the uh, so, you know some of the different kinds of dinosaurs um, are just spectacularly displayed. So Utah is a wonderful state, Colorado and so on. This this shoreline would have moved back and forth as sea level went up and down, all the way up to the Dakotas. Um, T Rex, in fact, comes from from uh, one of the Dakotas, a, among other places. And all the way up into Alberta, Canada. So this is this is dinosaur country. Nevada is just just didn't have the right habitat for a highly diverse, highly abundant uh, fauna of dinosaurs. I, I couldn't give a talk about Nevada's vertebrate fossil record without mentioning ichthyosaurs, though. Ichthyosaurs are the Nevada official state fossil. We have a wonderful state park in the middle of the state, um, northwest of Tonopah, called uh, Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. It's not a park you stop out on the way to somewhere else. It's, it's, a, it's a destination of its own, but it's a worthwhile destination. Uh, I, I was there several years ago, and it's the kind of place where they built the museum uh, over the fossils. So the fossil ichthyosaurs, which are huge, the size of a school bus, 
Um, there's, I forget how many, 12 or 13 of them that are all there kind of lined up. Um, and so they're, they're all available for you to see in place. So there, that's, that's an important vertebrate fossil. It's not a dinosaur. It's, and, it, and they're in Triassic, in Triassic age, the ichthyosaurs. And what happened there is that, back to this figure, in the Triassic, there was, this, there was a bay that came in from the left here. Sorry, I just didn't mean to do that. There was a bay that came in from the left and covered part of central Nevada uh, with seawater. And, and the ichthyosaurs liked that embayment and came in and, and uh, some of them died there. And so that's how we got ichthyosaurs. That embayment didn't make it down into southern Nevada. So we don't get ichthyosaurs in Clark County, for example. Um, it's, it's only in, southern, in, in central, central Nevada and, and maybe up in northwestern Nevada, I'm not sure. Um, so that's the ichthyosaur story. But it is, a, it's a wonderful fo fossil and appropriate to be our state fossil since we have a state park named after it. So the other reason that dinosaurs are not more abundant in Nevada, in addition to the habitat not being quite right, is preservation. And this is where my friend Nick Sane's story comes in. So this is a book that Nick wrote uh, a few years ago uh, when he, uh, about the, the geology, geologic treasures, hear me, close up this geologic treasures of Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area and Spring Mountain Ranch. And, and dinosaurs are an important part of the story. It's not the only part of the course. This is a picture, this, 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 is, this is the back of Nick here um, with a newspaper from the Review Journal 13 years ago. Prior to that, there were no reports that I had heard about of dinosaur tracks in Nevada or in Southern Nevada at least. Well, anywhere, anywhere in Nevada. And so somebody um, found some dinosaur tracks, hiking, hikers in, in Red Rock Canyon, and uh, Nick heard about it and got quite excited. And so this is a dinosaur track that was on the, uh, uh, on the B section, I think, of the, of the Review Journal in, in November of 2011, uh, 13 years ago. And, and since then, since we've known that, um, we found other sites. So for example, this is, a, this is the most spectacular dinosaur trackway site in, in Southern Nevada, in the Red Rock Canyon area, certainly, and probably anywhere in, in, in Southern Nevada. Um, this is one of my grad students. On, you can see that this is a big block of rock that fell off the cliff and exposed that surface. I'm not allowed to tell you by Red Rock Canyon uh, personnel where this is, but it's, I can tell you it's in Red Rock Canyon somewhere. It's a little tricky to get up on top of this rock. You have to have a little bit of uh, agility to climb up, the, climb up a slope and, and a, a tree to get there. But here's a close up of, of some of those tracks. So the, the dinosaurs that we get in, in Nevada, in Southern Nevada, um, are the ones that we do get are almost exclusively tracks. And the reason for that is gets back to this preservation issue. Uh, these rocks, the, the Aztec sandstone, which is what occurs in Red Rock Canyon and also Valley of Fire, are windblown sand dune deposits. Windblown sand dune deposits are terrible for preserving bones. They're not so bad for, for tracks. If, they're, if the sand is moist, uh, you, you can imagine that if it's, if it's dry sand and a dinosaur walks across the dry sand, it's just like you or me walking across a sand dune. We make a pit with our foot, but it's not a nice clean footprint and next wind blow, ne next wind storm is going to cover it up. But if the tracks, if the boy, if the sand is moist, uh, you can get some nice tracks like the ones in this photo. And then if if dry sand covers it up and all the conditions are just right, you can preserve it. Nobody has ever found. And of course, it's only been 13 years since we've known there were any dinosaur fossils in Red Rock Canyon. Um, but nobody's ever found any bones or teeth. Uh, and the reason is that that these windblown sand dune deposits are just terrible for preserving body fossils. It seems to me there should be a few teeth. The teeth are pretty resistant to erosion. So I, I'm half predicting that someday somebody's going to find a dinosaur tooth in the Aztec sandstone in Red Rock Canyon or, or Valley of Fire, but, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and, and But if you're interested in learning more about that, um, Nick's, Nick's book is the place to go. Uh, Nick tells me that they don't sell his book at the visitor center in Red Rock Canyon because he describes places that are off the trail. And they, as a general policy, 
do not want to encourage any of their visitors to go off the trail. So you'll have to get it somewhere else. And uh, I'm sure you can find it from Nick. Nick can tell you where to buy it. Um, also, Valley of Fire, the tracks are not quite as spectacular, although there is one site that I don't have a picture of, I can't show you, of, of dinosaur tracks. This is a this is a site in Red Rock Canyon, and these are theropod tracks, as were the ones I showed you in Red Rock Canyon. Um, theropods are, are, are uh, carnivorous, three-toed dinosaurs like T-Rex. These are not T-Rex, they're too old, they're Jurassic, um, but they're, they're the same group, general group of dinosaurs. And so it's a little hard, these are a little harder to see. So this was a, a project one of my grad students and I were working on at a this is not too far from Atlatl Rock, by the way, in Valley of Fire. So if you want to try to find dinosaur tracks and other kinds of fossils, uh, fossil footprints in, in uh, Valley of Fire, um, Atlatl Rock is a good place to look. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's a bunch there. If you just be patient and look down and, and uh, look underneath rocks and so on, that's the area where they are. So here again is that three-toed theropod dinosaur track in, in Red Rock, in Valley of Fire. So I want to end with a, with a little case study. Um, this is a project that I did at the museum. Um, and it's an example of a typical kind of research project. And it'll give me a chance to talk about different things that paleontologists do. Um, this project started with this guy here. His name is Tom Gordon. He lives in Carson City. And he was digging a trench in his backyard to put in a water line. He had no interest in fossils particularly, but he started digging this water line in his backyard and he started finding these bones. And his daughter, Brittany, said, Dad, we need a paleontologist to tell us what these bones are. So it was a, his daughter, Brittany, who went online and you know did a search for Nevada paleontologists and found me and sent me some pictures and piqued my interest. And I ended up taking a few trips up to Carson City and and working with Tom and his and his daughter uh, and several other volunteers on this project. So here we are in Tom Gordon's backyard uh, with a blue sunshade there, and those that pink ribbon you see are is is uh, each of those squares is a meter square, so that as we excavate the bones, we can you know have a little map and show on the, our map where that where each bone came from. So this is a pit. Out of this pit came an intact bovid. Now, bovids, bovidae is the family that bison belong to, cows belong to, pronghorn antelope belong to. So at first, we weren't even sure exactly what it was, but we I could tell it was a bovid. And it was buried pretty, you know, pretty deeply. You couldn't see it on the surface. This is this is a, one of my grad students at the time um, who was working with me on this. And here's Tom again. So um, the bones recovered from Tom's yard include one intact, complete bovid skeleton and jaw bones from four additional ones, one of which is a pronghorn. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, this is the only complete vertebrate skeleton I personally have ever been involved with excavating. Most of my career was actually with invertebrates, things like trilobites and, and burrows and uh, reef building sponges and so on. So it's not like my whole career was dealing with this, but I, I've dealt with a fair amount of vertebrates, and this is the only time we had a whole skeleton. It just very rarely happens, and certainly in, in uh, Tule Springs, it doesn't happen very often. Um, and once we started digging up these bones, we were astonished to see that many of them had cut marks on them, like that mark right there, those, those marks there. Cut marks are the kind of thing that archaeologists have expertise in. And, and since most of my career, I spent studying Paleozoic invertebrate fossils, which were hundreds of millions of years old, and humans were just not part of the story. I had no experience with cut marks. And, and that's part of the fun of doing paleontology, is you never know what you're going to get into. And often you get surprised, and you, and you find things that, that force you to go to other people for, for advice. And so, of course, the first thing I did was start showing this to archaeologists and say, you know, what can you tell me about this? You're the cut, you're the cut mark specialist. So here's a left humerus, the upper 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 left arm bone uh, of this bobbin uh, with another cut mark. Um, and so one of the first things that my archaeology colleagues told me is that, that those cut marks, this one in particular, were too deep and narrow 
to be a stone knife. That that wasn't done with an obsidian blade, for example. That was done with a, a steel knife, a steel blade. At least that's what the archaeologists thought. And and I and I don't have any reason to think that they're wrong. And so um, and also we we well one of the things we were able to determine was that these animals died when they were very young, including the one that was uh, in the in the pit. So this one here, for example, this is a left humerus again. Um, the, the end of the humerus, the so-called epiphysis, was not yet fused to the shaft. And so as, a, as animals are growing, and this includes humans, um, their legs and arms, of course, are getting longer. And so the end of the leg and arm doesn't get fused to the shaft completely until the animal, the individual, is fully grown. And in bison, that occurs at about age five. And so, and since it wasn't yet fused here, um, oh, sorry, that it occurs at age six. And so we knew that this animal was less than six years old, probably around five, five and a half. Well, of course, um, we wanted to know how long ago these animals died. And so this is where radiocarbon dating comes in. So we sent off a sample to a radiocarbon dating lab, very specialized technique that, uh, you know, that you don't just do in your own laboratory. Very few um, paleontologists have, a, have their own radiocarbon lab. They all, they all use a, a commercial lab of some sort. So this is the results that I got back from the, the radiocarbon lab. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of my barrier here so I can see it better. Okay, so um, this blue line shows the, the age uh, or, or it shows the variation in atmospheric radiocarbon, or carbon-14, over the last several hundred years. And so what the lab said is, is that your bones could be, uh, because of the fluctuation, they couldn't give me a precise date, and that's not that uncommon. Um, so they said, well, your bones could be from the early 1600s until the early 1700s, or they might be from the 1800s up to the early 1900s. Well, because of the fact that the cut marks were made by steel knives, that pretty much eliminated this earlier possibility. There, there's no, no expectation that steel blades, <coughs> excuse me, that steel blades were available in Carson City area, the Carson Valley, as early as the 1600s. And so that pretty much eliminated that. So we're dealing with a real, real recent phenomenon here. So this is, this is the 1800s to early 1900s. Um, which is certainly l younger than than I expected, but that's you know again again you never know quite what to expect. So this is what our kind of our our working hypothesis was that these that these that this bison was being was being butchered by Native Americans um, and skinned. You know they were this is a this is a drawing that that one of my artist colleagues made for me of specifically for this site in Carson the Carson Valley. Um, showing this, this animal being skinned and butchered. Um, and then our, our suspicion was, because we found this not exposed on the surface, if it had been exposed on the surface, um, first of all, the carnivores would have gotten to it and, and, and dragged the bones away, and, and it would have been just like the fossil skeletons that we find in, in, in uh, Tule Springs, for example, where we don't find whole skeletons. So somehow or other, this animal uh, got got spared the indig indignity, if you will, of being dismembered by carnivores, wolves or coyotes or, or whatever. And so one likely reason for that is flooding of the Carson River. So Tom's, Tom's house, I don't have the, ah, it doesn't matter. Tom's yard, in his whole house, that whole neighborhood is, in, is on Carson River floodplain deposits. And so and a, and a fork of the Carson River is just a, a, you know, a half a mile away or so. So our suspicion was that the that the Carson River flooded, and and as it started to flood, these folks got their skin and meat probably and hightailed it out of there, and then the the river flooded and buried this whole animal and and uh, in river floodplain deposits, and and that's how we found it. So that was our kind of working hypothesis that this site was a springtime hunting camp because that's when the that's when the the river floods where the Washos, which is the the local tribe. Um, were skinning and butchering bison and pronghorns using metal tools for that they had just acquired by trading or somehow. Um, and the Carson River flooded and the overbank deposits buried the skeleton of the animal that the animal that the washos were butchering. 
and that carcass was thus prevented from being dismembered and dispersed by carnivores. Okay, so that was a working hypothesis. When we were excavating this animal, and here, here's uh, my grad student again down in the pit excavating that, and here you can see the rib cage way down there, and a close-up of the rib cage. And this is Eric Shamroy, my grad student. And what Eric noticed, and then we all noticed, is you can't see it in this photo, but around that rib cage, there were thousands of these little things. And we didn't know what they were, but you know, the, the little light in my brain went off saying, there's a story here. Whatever these were, we thought that they were somehow connected to insects and uh, we're gonna find out and maybe it'll help us interpret this site. So they turn out to be puparia, they're cocoons effect effectively. So if you picture a, a, a a caterpillar that's going to become a butterfly, it goes into a cocoon phase for a, a few days or, or a week or two, and then the, the beautiful butterfly emerges from that cocoon. These are cocoons, but they're not butterfly cocoons, they're blowfly cocoons. And blowflies are very well known in the crime scene investigation world because when an investigator is investigating a dead body of a human, whether it's a hiker who had a heart attack or a murder victim, uh, the investigators want to know how long the body has been there and the blowflies can tell them that. Because when the blowflies lay their eggs, um, the eggs hatch out into maggots. You know, all know what the maggots do. And then the maggots eventually turn into these puparia or cocoons. And then eventually a the, uh, few days later, the adult blowfly emerges from the cocoon and the whole life cycle um, starts all over again. And because it's so important in crime scene investigation, there have literally been PhD dissertations written on the life cycle of different species of blowflies. So I got connected with a blowfly specialist at Washington State University. That's what he specializes. His, his email address is blowflyguy at washingtonstate.org.edu or something like that. Uh, and he was able to, he didn't know at first, but he was able to compare the, the Gordon Bison site, our, our site from Carson City on the left, um, with the, the puparia uh, and, and some of the adult fly parts with, with uh, this one particular species of blowfly called the black blowfly, Formia regina. And so we knew what species of blowfly it was. Um, there was already a literature on what the life cycle was and so on. The other thing we, th that we supposed we, we were surprised by is when we were looking at these blowfly puparia, we noticed that that a third of them, well, we didn't know how many at first, that some of the blowfly puparia, some of these cocoons, like the one in the bottom of this picture, had not had their end knocked off. The one on the top of the picture is typical when the, when the, when the pupa develops into the adult fly, of course, the fly needs to get out of that cocoon and so the fly knocks off the end of the cocoon and flies away. And so typically when you find a, find a blowfly cocoon, um, the end is missing. Well, 35% and one of my, or some of my volunteers actually counted 100 blowfly puparia to get these percentages. 35% of our blowfly puparia had their ends that were not knocked off, meaning that the adult fly for some reason died inside that cocoon. And, and so we thought, well, that seems odd. And, and, and my, my colleague at Washington State, the blowfly guy, agreed that that's a pretty high percentage of, of mortality for, for the pup, pupa in the pupae in the, in the cocoons. And, and there could be several reasons, a couple reasons for that. One is it could be cold nights. If the temperatures get down too cold, then the, the adult fly freezes effectively inside that cocoon and it never emerges. Or another reason could be, I learned from my colleague at Washington State University, could be a certain group of, ma of wasps called pteromalid wasps that lay their eggs in blowfly puparia. Talk about a very specialized part of your life cycle. So these wasps seek out blowfly puparia, lay their, sort of sting the pu pu pupa, lay their eggs in there, and then the, the, the wasp larva kills the pupa and then exit through a small millimeter sized hole. And sure enough, we found some of those. We found some millimeter sized holes, but only, only about 30, only about 3% of the closed puparia had this kind of a, what we, we interpreted to be a, a wasp exit hole. So our, our conclusion regarding that was that 
because only 3% um, had these WASP exit holes, we concluded that that wasn't the main reason for such a high mortality, that cold nights was probably the main reason. So then we start getting into the climate history of the, of the, of the Reno Carson Valley area um, back in the 1960s before global warming has increased it. And so what this diagram shows is the green, blue, yellow, and red zones show the zones that in which blowflies um, are either uh, very abundant. The green zone means that they, they're happy and, and they're going to be at you know, that temperature zone, that temperature range, the, the blowflies are going to be doing fine. Um, the yellow zone shows that blowflies are going to be around, but not nearly as abundant. And then the red zone, uh, there are no blow, 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 blow flies at all. And, and no surprise, it's in the winter months that, that the red zone is there that where the blowflies are just going to be gone. So that basically eliminated the winter as being a time where, where our, our bison died. Um, so that and, and in, in the, uh, so it could be summer, fall or winter. Uh, summer, fall, or spring, rather. Um, and the Carson River only floods in the spring. And if these are really floodplain deposits, it's in April, May, and June that the Carson River is flooding. The Carson River doesn't, that's when the, the snow is melting up in Lake Tahoe, of course. And so the Carson River isn't flooding in September or October. Um, and so that pretty much eliminated the, 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 the fall as a possible season. Um, and so the so a combination of the blowfly data with the Carson River flooding data um, told us that these animals were butchered in the spring shortly before a flood of the Carson River when the nights were cold enough to kill a high percentage of the blowfly puparia. So th this is the kind of project that I just love because it, I learned so much. It gets I, you know I didn't know anything about blowflies or cut marks, but I do now. Um, and so paleontology is such a wonderful field because it overlaps with archaeology, it overlaps with entomology sometimes when you're dealing with insects. Um, it, it just it exposes you to all kinds of things that you never would have thought that you were going to get introduced to. So we, we published just last year um, this paper in a, in a, this is a paleontological journal called Paleos. So these were all the, all my volunteers and colleagues who worked with me on this project, the bison and the blowfly using puparia of the black blowfly. Um, to constrain the season of death and taphonomic history of an early historic age bison, Carson City, Nevada. So that's a I think a kind of a cool little um, vignette or case study that uh, tells us something about how what paleontology is all about. So that's the end of my talk. I, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. All right. Thank you, I do know that um, we do have one question in the chat. Um, if you want to read it, or Joy, if you'd like to ask it, you may. Or, but I just want to read it so everyone can hear it as well. So maybe I'll start with this one. Um, Joy Lane asks: Do the Pleistocene, oh, Pleistocene fossils at the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles predate the ones at Tule Springs fossil beds? That's a wonderful question. Uh, basically, they're the same. So the, 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 the La Brea tar pits fossils are the same group of animals, the bison and, and, and Colombian mammoth and saber-toothed cats and dire wolves and so on that we get in Tule Springs. And so they're the same age, basically. Um, a huge difference is in the preservation. In, in the tar pits, the animals get stuck in the tar and, and just sort of sink into the tar. And they're, they actually get whole whole skeletons. The skeletons sometimes disarticulate once they're buried, but basically they get all the parts. The other big difference, huge difference between La Brea tar pits fauna and what we get in Tule Springs is the relative abundance of vertebra of, uh, of carnivores. The, the La Brea tar pits was a carnivore trap. So you might get one camel stuck in the mud and then the, the, uh, you know, the text messages go out to all the dire wolves in the community. Hey, you hear there's a camel stuck in the tar. Let's go get it. And then you have 10 dire wolves that are all in the tar trying to get that camel. And, and then you have 10 dire wolves stuck and only one camel. And so it's, it's, it's a completely inverted um, relative frequency pattern in, in, the, in, in Tule Springs. 
almost everything we find is a is a an herbivore, either uh, mammoths or, or bison or camels or occasionally horses and others. But they're all herbivores, except as I mentioned, except for the, the a very rare toe bone or kneecap or something. Whereas in the La Brea tar pits, they're mostly vertebrates, are mostly carnivores rather. If you visit the the tar pits, which I would encourage you to do if you're in Southern California, it's definitely worth a a, a, a visit there. Um, you see row after row after row of of saber-toothed cat skulls and and dire wolf skulls. We just don't get those kinds of skulls um, here. And, and rarely do we get any carnivores at all. So they're the fossils are the same species, roughly the same age, but very different preservation, very different relative abundance of, of herbivores and carnivores. But that's a that's a great question. And Joy says, uh, so cool, thanks. I'm a carnivore aficionado. Okay, I didn't know there was such a thing, yeah. but sure. Um, Steve, I have to say that uh, I have horses and I use a product called fly predators, which are um, basically little wasps that lay their eggs in the pupa of flies in the uh -huh. horse manure. And wow. what that does is they, you know, it lays their eggs in there and then they kill that that larva and then the little wasps are just so small they don't bother the horses at all but it really cuts down on the flies so this is interesting to me well, to see I, I'm, I'm so glad you told me that I, I had never heard of that of using wasps to actually control the fly population that's, that's yes wonderful. yeah that's yes. very cool that's, that's yeah certainly that's something it, that I'll take away from this they they uh, send them to you um every month and it's a little bag of sawdust with a bunch of these little brown um they look like mouse poop <laughs> is what they uh, look like but um but you wait till there's a few little wasps moving around in there and then you go sprinkle them over the the manure and it works pretty good wow that's that's great yeah yeah my my, my brother is is a horse horseman and I'm going to be visiting him in a couple months so I'll, I'll he lives in California uh, I'll definitely talk to him about that and he I, I suspect that he knows all about it I'm sure he does yeah it's it's pretty common um the only good thing or the one of the good things is that they work in large numbers of horses but everybody has to use them it can't be just you and then your neighbors all have horses because then they don't do enough yeah good. I see sure um anyone else have questions come on you guys No one? Not even in the chat? Can this is interesting. I Brenda, plan on using Brenda, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, good. Someone had a question? I got a question, just a comment. I said that I, this was very enjoyable and I plan on visiting some of these sites that you were talking about. Great. We're new to Nevada and it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have a wonderful fossil record in Nevada. Um, and, and some of our really exciting fossils are those that are not not well known to the general public up in Esmeralda County, roughly halfway between here and Reno, um, are um, some of the most famous Cambrian age fossiliferous beds in, in the world. I, I did my PhD dissertation on on fossils in the in the in the in the Esmeralda County area. Um, and um, and many of I mean I still review papers by people who were still working on those. So, uh, but those are not ones that you hear about because they're not quite as as visually exciting as uh, you know some of the others. But Nevada is a wonderful state for fossils, uh, just not so much for dinosaurs except for the footprints. There is one one genus of dinosaur called Nevada Dromius that my former grad student Josh Bondi named. Josh is now the director of the Nevada State Museum up in Carson City, and he's much more of a dinosaur guy than I am. And he, it was sort of a, 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 a goal for him to find dinosaur bones in Nevada and, and out in Valley of Fire State Park, not in the red Aztec sandstone, but in the overlying Cretaceous age deposits. Um, there are occasionally, if you work real hard at it, you can find a few dinosaur bones, and, and Josh has done that and actually named a new genus called Nevada Dromius of, of dinosaurs from Nevada. So there's one genus of dinosaurs named from Nevada, but boy, you really have to know where to look and, and work hard at it to find any bones. Okay. Um, Milo, you had a question? 
need to unmute. I thought I'd show up early, you know, 10 to 7, but I missed the by an hour. Uh -oh. uh, and I noticed when I had logged in, it said recording in progress. Uh, would there be a recording uh, I could look at uh, later? Would that be available? Yes, sir. It'll be on our YouTube channel, Friends of Gold Butte. Use our YouTube channel. It'll be there. Okay, very good. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Joy has another question. Isn't there a trilobite site or quarry near Caliente? There is there is a site. Um let's see. Let's see. I'm I'm trying to think. There's a the, the one the closest site is right out at French Fair Mountain, just oh, uh, closest to me. I, I I I realize most of you are not living in Las Vegas, I guess. But um there there are trilobites in different places. Um the site near Caliente, I can't think of where that is. So probably there is, and if you did a you know Google search for trilobites near Caliente, you could find out. There's a trilobite site that's actually used to be and maybe still is marked on the highway, trilobite collecting site or something like that. Uh, I think on the highway between here and Panaca, between here, I mean Las Vegas and Panaca. Um, I can't remember that's a as a, a mountain pass there, and I can't remember the name of it. Uh, the last time I heard of any, I have, I, I was up there years and years ago, and there, there were plenty of trilobites. Last time I heard of somebody who had been there, they said it was pretty picked over and hard to find trilobites, but that's another place. So there are trilobite places around, um, but, but you have to, you know, like a lot of things, you have to, you have to work at it and kind of do your homework ahead of time and be patient. But there, there, uh, Nevada is a, is a good state for, for, for trilobites in general. Joy, Joy says, that's it. You nailed it. She, she okay. knows you know where it is. Okay. Anyone else have a question, comment? Uh, yes, actually. Um, this Mitch, uh, I know there's a, a small number of dinosaur tracks out in Gold Butte um, in a hidden spot. Um, had, do you know if anybody's identified what sort of dinosaur those came from? Um, there's, uh, there's, there are some tracks out in the Gold Butte area that I have photographed and I haven't ever published anything on it, I don't think, but I don't think they're dinosaur tracks. Uh, I think they're too old for that, but I haven't, it's been so long since I've been out there um, that I, I just can't remember the details of what kind of tracks they are. I don't remember them being dinosaur tracks, but they're some sort of vertebrate animal tracks. Um, you, you know, they could be other, some sort of a, a lizard, for example, a good a good size Paleozoic lizard. So uh, so I just I just sorry I just can't remember. But yeah, out in Gold Butte in a remote area um, that my friend Tom Clough found. Um, I don't know if Tom's on the on the call tonight, but uh, Tom I think showed me those, and he probably remembers better than I do what we interpreted them to be. One of my grad students, the same one who you who I showed pictures of, um, in down in the pit in in Carson City, looking looking at at the uh, blowfly puparia, um, is a is a is a specialist in photogrammetry, which in which you take pictures from different angles of fossils or any object you're interested in. And and I remember um, him, Eric Shamroy, my my photogrammetry expert, out there with me and Tom and probably a couple other people out in the Gold Butte area photographing those fossils. And so Eric's got all those photos, images on his on his camera somewhere and digitally saved. And what you do then is take all those images, dump it into software, uh, photogrammetry software, and then it makes an image that you can spin around. And we've all seen these kinds of things um, on, a, on a computer screen that really shows the details from different angles. Um, so we'll eventually uh, publish something on that. I need to Sort of get back in that every time I retired from UNLV in 2019. I've been working at the at the museum ever since then, and I've been working on a backlog of projects um, mm -hmm. that I haven't worked my way through yet. I and mean, I've still got a few, but one of them is those those gold butte uh, vertebrate tracks. So I'll eventually get back to those. Yeah, I know you mentioned those when you spoke one time before. I did. It was shortly I, I, after. I'm, I'm sure um, I did, and I just don't remember the details of that. Yeah. Anyone else? 
Steve, what are the hours and the cost for the Las Vegas uh, Natural History We're Museum? We're open every day except Christmas and Thanksgiving from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon. I think the admission is fifteen dollars, maybe for, for maybe for Nevada residents, it might be a dollar or two less than that. Something something like that. Um, okay. So yeah. Okay, and sounds it's great. Good. It's, yeah. It's especially a good place, I think, to bring kids. Um, you know, but not only for kids. We have a wonderful um Egypt exhibit um that was originally in the Lex Luxor Hotel. Years ago, when the Luxor opened, they put a lot of money into this Egypt exhibit and worked with, with Egyptian scholars and so on and reproduced King Tut's tomb and all that stuff very authentically. And the, the Luxor Hotel finally decided or finally learned, I guess, that their hotel visitors really didn't care about Egyptian history. <laughs> they wanted to gamble and see strip shows. So so that we ended up, they, they donated it or somebody paid to, for them to donate it. Uh, to our museum. So we have a wonderful Egypt exhibit, um, lots of dinosaurs and geology and, and dioramas of life on different continents and so on. So I think it's especially good place to bring kids uh, to, to see, you know, all kinds of, of cool exhibits. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, maybe we'll make a field trip as a group sometime and go down there. That sounds sure. like a lot of fun. Sure. I'm usually um, there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, by the way. Tuesday, so, Wednesday, Thursday. Good to yeah, know that's we can good, come and that's harass time, you. Yeah, and and if you do make a trip out of it, um, let me know ahead of time, and so so we can, you know, I'd certainly like to sh be able to show you my lab and what we're doing and, and all that stuff. So be careful what you volunteer. Okay, because you okay. might have to. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I'd be happy to one do. more question: uh, Is the Dinosaur Museum in St. George geared toward Jurassic fauna? Um, the dinosaur track. What I forget what it's called. Dinosaur trackway something site. Um, so those that that's a really that's another place sort of similar to the Ichthyosaur State Park in Nevada, where they where they kept the fossils in place and built the building over it, so they didn't have to actually dig up the fossils. And those are tracks. Uh, there may be a bone or two in there too, but but essentially tracks. Very well done. The the manager there. Is, is just a first rate paleontologist. Uh, and and so it's, but I can't remember the exact age, whether it's Jurassic or or not. I'm guessing it's Jurassic and not Cretaceous. It's certainly one of those. Um, the dinosaurs did begin in the Triassic, but I'm sure they, they didn't get really diverse until the until the Jurassic and Cretaceous. So I am i don't know the exact age. It's been years since I've been up to, to see that facility, but it's a wonderful, place in St. George with lots of dinosaur tracks and, and nice exhibits. Nice. Okay, anyone else? Going once. Yeah, Brenda, this is Mike. I just might mention uh, on my way travels back from the Midwest to, uh, to Mesquite, we often go to different places. And one of the places we went last spring is the Dinosaur National Monument up in Northwest, Northeast uh, Utah. And right. they did the same th thing there, Steve, if you've been up there. I have been, yeah. They built that uh, uh, on this huge dinosaur wall. They built a, the building around it. It's exactly. pretty, it's exactly. very neat. Uh, if anybody has a chance, it's- Yeah, uh, great. Thank you, Mike. That's, yeah, that's a spectacular place to go. and. I, I, again, I, I, it's certainly worth if you're, you know, up in that neighborhood at all. That that's uh, up in near Vernal, Utah. As as Mike mentioned, they, it's a lot like like the Trackway Museum in St. George and the, the the Ichthyosaur State Park in Central Nevada. They built the building over the over the fossils, and in that case, it's a tilted layer of of rock with this packed with bones, and so it it I don't. I don't know exactly what the depositional environment was. I suspect it was a, a, a floodplain kind of situation where the bones got concentrated by by floodwaters. But it's just it's just this huge tilted layer of rock packed with dinosaur bones. It's just spectacular. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, it's in Vernal, Utah, or near Vernal, Utah, Dinosaur National Monument. R definitely yeah. worth a visit if you're up in that. Yeah. And I think you're right, Steve. From what I remember, it was a uh, some type of river. Uh, yeah, plane, flood plane type thing, and all the 
the uh, the animals kind of died there. The right, one, and that's the that's the Morrison Formation that's exposed the, in at Dinosaur National Monument. The Morrison Formation is a is a Jurassic formation, very famous for its dinosaurs. So that's a really great place to get a feeling for for the Morrison Formation. Um, thank you so much, and thank you to the rest of you for coming and. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for different things on our meetup and um, our newsletter and our website and that and just um, join in when you can. It's it's a great group of folks and we learn a lot and have a great time.